Lexicographers will tell you that time, the word, T-I-M-E, is the most used noun in the English language. We can't get through the day without talking about time all the time. Sean Carroll here talks about the excessive use of the word time, concluding by saying, we can't get through the day without talking about time all the time. This is because time is an extremely comprehensive invention. It has been tracking every moment of every day and year for three and a half thousand years. Using the term moment here may be a bit confusing as it's considered to be a very brief period of time, but it co actually comes from the Latin momentum, which is an event. So the correct definition of moment is actually a very brief period of an event. The briefest that a moment can be tracked to is one billionth of a second by an atomic clock. Time has become a replacement term for other words. For example, when Sean says we can't get through the day without talking about time all the time, what's actually meant is we can't get through the day without talking about time on every occasion. So what time is, I don't think is the problem. The issue, the real puzzles, come about when we talk about the properties that time has. Sean here states that what time is, he doesn't think, is the problem. The real issues, the real puzzles come about when we talk about the properties that time has. This is a strange statement to make because, for most part, what time actually is, is what people want to know. Yet. He doesn't want to explain it, despite implying that he knows what it is. In addition, according to Brian Greene in the YouTube video, The Science of Time Explained by Brian Greene, Brian acknowledged that he doesn't know what time is and he doesn't think anybody does. Sean does state his view about time being real at the 314 mark, but not with any explanation of how it's real. We have a past, we have a present, we have a future. How are they different? Are we moving through it? We have memories of the past, but we have no memories of the future. Why is that? Where does that asymmetry come from? Why are we all born young? Why do we all inevitably age? Why do we think that we can affect the future but not the past? Could we possibly travel back into it? Anyway, there's a lot of questions about the nature of time that are really confusing and many of them we don't know the answer to, but what time is, I don't think it's one of them. In talking about the properties of time, Sean referred to the past, present and future. He then asks, how are they different? Are we moving through it? This is a fair question because if time is real, then the belief is that we're moving through it. But the next few questions are bordering on the ridiculous, such as why do we have memories of the past, but don't have memories of the future? This is quite absurd because it should be obvious that memories are our brain's record of things and things that haven't happened yet obviously can't be recorded. Then he asks, why are we all born young and why do we inevitably age? Reason for that is because everything biological starts as a planted seed and being born young and aging is the natural order. If Sean thinks our inevitable aging is due to time, he's greatly misguided. As regards aging to old age, that's a result of telomere deterioration. Then he concludes with, why do we think we can affect the future and not the past? Could we possibly travel back into it? This last two part question gives a clue as to why is the likely reason for the previous ridiculous questions which is because, as YouTube thought he too put it, a sci-fi fetish some physicists have. You see, most videos on YouTube that deal with the subject of time do delve into the possibility of time travel. If time is an actual structure of the universe, then the possibility of travelling through it is worthy of consideration, especially as clocks are known to tick at different rates in different environments, such as high velocity and strong gravity, as opposed to a neutral stationary clock. And, as clocks measure time, if they slow down, then time does also? Well, actually, this isn't true. Clocks don't measure time. They tell the time when measuring events, primarily Earth's axis rotation. 
There's a simple argument against the clock measuring time idea, which is, if we don't know what time is, then how do we know clocks measure it? You see, fourth dimension time is actually unknown, as it has never stood the test of experimentation. Why is it believed that clocks measure time? Well, we have to go back in history to a period when the word time didn't exist. This was somewhere between the invention of the sundial clocks of Egypt in 1500 BC and the coining of the word time or Kronos in 700 BC in Greece. When the word time was coined, it wasn't done so with the invention in mind, but rather the abstract sense that people started experiencing. We know this because there was a god of time formed named Kronos with a K, who was described as a destructive, all-devouring force, whereas the invention just measured the processes of the destructive devouring forces of erosion, aging and decay. What was it that made people perceive the units of measurement as not only representative of the passage of events, but also representative of what caused events to unfold? That would be the sense of what came to be known as time passing. Even though there wasn't the word time, there were the units of measurement in use, and as the sense of time passing is in recognition of these units, then even without the word time, it was possible to experience this sense of what came to be known as time passing. This sense of time passing is an illusion, because first of all, it's in recognition of our invented units, and also, if it's real, then the implication is that thousands of years ago, someone put a stick in the ground to track the day and inadvertently accessed the fourth dimension. In addition, if you think about how close this sense of time passing is to the passage of the day and year, it's just the passage of the day and year, with the progress of their phases from morning to morning and spring to spring being translated into time units. This creates an effect that makes us experience the passage of these phases as the passage of time. In the world of magical illusions, to accomplish an illusion, what's required are props and misdirection. Misdirection is where attention is drawn to one thing to take it away from something else. With the illusion of time passing, the time units provide the misdirection because the focus is on the passing of the units which takes attention away from what the time units represent, which is the passing of the day and the year. Basically, the rotations are the props which create the passing effect, and the units of measurement create the misdirection for the time effect. This is a result of fusing technology, the clock, with nature, the rotations, which caused our perceptions to change, because before this invention, we lived on a planet in a solar system. But since then, we've actually been living on a clock that's in a calendar, being bombarded by time units on our daily and yearly passages through space. Earlier we considered the etymology of the word moment. Another word that is worthy of consideration, especially in light of our current discussion, is spell. An example of the word in use would be a long spell of time. The likely reason that time came to be referred as spell is because the long time that someone may be left waiting is unknown, mysterious, and therefore has a magical effect. Spells aren't used in the world of magical illusions. It's a dark arts practice, but people are spellbound by time passing. One of the most noticeable features of time is that it has a direction, right? That there's a difference between the past and future. Sometimes we think about this as just an intrinsic feature of reality. Like the past already happened, it's in the books, the future is up for grabs, it hasn't happened yet, and the present is where we live. But then along comes physics. And what people notice about our best theories of physics is that those theories do not distinguish between the past and the future. Here Sean talks about one of his pet subjects, the arrow of time, time's one direction of flow. He talks about the difference between past and future as an example. He later says, it'd take a lot of mental discipline to say 
time could exist without an hour. Thing is, as mentioned already, the past and future aren't literal constructs, but mental ones, based on our memories and anticipatory abilities. They're not a holding for events that have happened or have yet to happen, and they're directionless. There are different views with regard to past, present and future, such as the Eternalist and Block Universe view. The Eternalist view supports the existence of all the tenses. The Block Universe states that the past and present only exist, but the future yet to happen. Then there is the Presentist view, which states that what is being presented is the sum total of reality. Events that have happened simply cease to exist anymore. For those that have yet to happen, they will be influenced by current events. This can also be referred to as the eternal now and dynamic present. Events always happen now. Interestingly, this presentist view does connect the present accurately with its etymology, its root meaning, but it doesn't do so with the past and future. For example, Past comes from English past and Middle English past, both meaning gone, like when someone dies. Present comes from Latin presence meaning to be, as opposed to past which is not to be anymore and future which is not to be yet. Future comes from the Latin futurus meaning grow become. This highlights the interactions involved with regard to present influence on future events. The reason past and future deviated from their original meanings is because of a mental construct that developed that made people see the past and future in a dimensional sense, where events exist that have happened and, according to the eternalist view, even events that haven't happened yet also exist. What caused this change was obviously the invention of the clock, because past and future became time-related words and clocks are instruments of time. Actual scientific discoveries don't change terminologies from their original meanings, so the change in meanings had to be due to an illusion, because deception is at play if people start perceiving something differently than what it was, it was originally meant to be. And if you think about how the past and future are perceived as at opposite ends of a dimensional line and also a holding for events, it it does correlate. With regard to direction in relation to time or events, it's a false perception. Because even in the macro world, events don't follow a literal direction, but rather the logical order of cause and effect. Direction with regard to events is the same mental construct as past and future. To demonstrate the directionless of time or events, we will consider counting numbers, because time is a number system and counting is an event. Say for example counting from 1 to 10, it's deemed as counting forward, but it can also be described as going up a number. That's two directions to describe the same process because literally there is no direction, just a logical order. In Middle and Far Eastern countries, where writing is done right to left as opposed to our left to right, they also perceive forward as right to left. Direction in this sense should only be meant figuratively, like when someone is making forward strides in their progress or taking backward steps, because events unfold three-dimensionally in three-dimensional space, due to a flow of energy, not a flow of time, and only happening on the stage that is what's present. As we live in the vicinity of an influential object, the Earth, the arrow of time is exactly the same way. We, in our everyday lives, perceive an arrow of time because we live in the aftermath of an influential event, the Big Bang. And that gets us into a realm of the concept of entropy. Sean previously had been talking about how in outer space there's no special direction, no arrow of space. But on Earth, due to gravity, we have a special direction. So likewise, time has direction in the world around us, even though as Sean states at the 152 mark, it doesn't have direction in the laws of physics. 
The reason given by Sean for the hour of time existing in the macro world is due to an influential event, the Big Bang. The same way the hour of space exists in the macro world, due to an influential object, the Earth. This parallel doesn't make any sense for the simple reason space does have direction. He uses the term special direction, highlighting the lack of gravity in outer space, which provides no basis for direction. But just because we cannot comprehend direction in outer space doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It actually has three arrows.